Hey, before we get started, I want to tell you about some bad actors out there. These are people that are trying to sell you annuities. Annuities uh, just don't make sense for the investor. They make sense for the person selling it to you. They have uh, tremendous commissions. They also make sense for the company who created the annuity. Uh, Our advice for most annuities is to stay away. And that's simply because we are approaching financial planning from a fiduciary and fee-only standpoint, meaning that when we look at investments, we're trying to figure out what's best for the client. And most importantly, we don't sell product. People come to us to solve financial uh, questions or problems or help set goals for the future. So when we break all this down, uh, I don't know that in the history of our company, we have ever recommended an annuity uh, simply because we don't have quotas. We don't have sales quotas to uh, to meet. Uh, our quota is to make sure that each family that comes to us gets the best uh, financial advice possible. The bad actors out there, um, a lot of times, are nice people. And you might know them from a church or uh, baseball or something like that. It uh, doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means that they've drunk the Kool-Aid of their organization to sell products that don't work in the best interest of their clients. So stay away. If you want to learn more, you can go to our website at wiserinvestor.com. At the very bottom of our screen, we have buyer beware of the annuity salesman. To input your email and you'll get download our white paper on why you should avoid annuities. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Wise Wealth Management Roundtable. We believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom are my co-hosts, Brad Lyons and Matthews Barnett. Hey, guys. Hi, Casey. How's it going? So this week, we are going to talk about custom indexing. Uh, the future is coming. This is what Brad told me. It's always interesting talking about the future because <laughs> you know it's not so precise <laughs> as the current. Well, let's just talk about indexing for a minute to make sure all of our listeners are uh, kind of knowing where we're coming from. So uh, Jack Bogle created the first index fund back in 1970-something, wasn't it? I believe so. Yeah. It was the S&P 500 Index Fund. Actually, it was a, um, a thesis he had, I believe, in, in college that everyone told him he was crazy. And he eventually decided, okay, I'm going to launch a fund that just owns 500 of the S&P 500 stocks. And people thought, who would ever buy that? <laughs> Everybody bought that, actually. Yeah. Um, and it's worked out really well. The evolution of that became uh, Vanguard and uh, a lot of uh, different types of indexes, small cap, mid cap, foreign, uh, carried on into bonds. And that became kind of a staple uh, investment for for uh, over a couple of decades. Then along came exchange-traded funds. So the first exchange-traded fund, I believe, was around uh, early 90s, 91, 93, somewhere in there, or SPY. SPY brought out by State Street. That's right. So SPY uh, also replicated the S&P 500, but it did so in a very uh, unique way that Uh, protected the investor from capital gains. Uh, Not if you sold the shares necessarily, but holding the account, you wouldn't get these capital gains passed to you from the portfolio rebound. From the individual securities, right? That's right. That's right. Through the creation redemption process. A lot of companies, uh, fund managers would buy SPY and hold it uh, so they get market-like returns while waiting to invest uh, money elsewhere according to their various strategies. Uh, From SPY... Uh, comes into the early 2000s, all of a sudden ETFs just kind of uh, took off as a great way to index. So we created all these passive, uh, very, what you call them, plain vanilla wrapper ETFs that just held the market, uh, very low turnover, very low expense ratio. In fact, uh, it started a race to be who could be the cheapest. You can now buy the S&P 500 for three basis points or otherwise known as 0.003 of 1% per year. Uh, So indexing got really, really cheap. Then uh, we started seeing a transition from actively managed mutual funds, uh, where we have 
you know, people picking and choosing stock that came over to the ETF world. So that we have people investing in ETFs that uh, have high turnover. Sometimes every corner, uh, every quarter, calendar quarter, there's turnover. Sometimes it's uh, could could be daily turnover, depending on the fund manager. We had factor ETFs where we would invest in a certain uh, manner. So if you wanted only growth stocks, or if you wanted um, only stocks that um, that exhibited quality balance sheets, you could buy an ETF with that. If you wanted foreign, but you didn't want financials and your foreign holdings, you could buy an ETF for that. So we developed uh, all types of ETFs today. We had an ETF podcast here recently talking about all the benefits of ETFs and how to build portfolios using exchange traded funds. So now, um, you know, with non-fungible tokens and Bitcoins and (laughs) virtual homes that don't exist that people are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for, um, we have something maybe that, that can stick in custom indexing. Brad, why don't you explain this to our listeners? What is a, what is a custom index? Well, interestingly enough, uh, you had kind of covered the waterfront on ETFs out there and the ability to create an index based on any thought or theme an investor may wish to have. But they were still somewhat fragmented out there in the industry. If you wanted a theme-based index, such a factor, you could buy one, but you couldn't actually get exactly what you wanted, but you got what was available. And this goes from even the bland, basic core indexes, the S&P 500, the small cap, the mid caps, the international. You got it all when you, when you, when you bought into it. But imagine if you were an investor and you wanted a portion of it. You wanted some of the S&P 500, but you wanted to exclude certain companies. That really w- wasn't available. Let's say you wa- you had some large cap stocks already in your portfolio and you wanted to keep them for, for various reasons, which we can go into later. So when you bought an index fund, you really wanted to exclude them because you already own them. Well, that wasn't available. The index ETFs, as they currently exist, are still somewhat fragmented and narrowly defined by the index itself. Imagine if you were an an investor who said, you know, in a perfect world, I'd like to create my own index. I want to customize my portfolio to me. Now, that's different from hiring an active manager. It's saying... I want as broad a diversified portfolio as I can get, but I want it customized to my circumstance. And my circumstances are basically, I have a unique risk tolerance. I have a tax circumstance that's unique to me. I have preferences in the way I invest my money because I want to portray and who I am through my investments. And I want to provide capital to certain parts of the market and to not provide capital to other parts of the market. Those are factors, and they're unique to me. A custom index would allow an investor to create that customized index portfolio unique to them and their circumstance. So custom indexing has come about as the ability that the fintech world, financial technologies, have actually come to exist, either through artificial intelligence or the ability to um, for, to track positions and to trade positions and to report on positions down to the share level in every client account. Custom indexing is a great way to keep what you have if you want it and build a portfolio around the rest of it based upon, again, your th- three unique factors, your tax situation, your risk tolerance, and your preferences. So basically what, what's happening is we don't need a BlackRock. We don't need a iShares. We don't need any of those companies. Essentially, your the, the advisory firm is just getting software and coming up with, okay, I want to own the S&P, but I want to have S- S&P without home improvement stocks because um, 20% of my net worth is in my Home Depot options or uh, – individual security, right? That's right. 
That's and right. So and you, why double up on that? Right. And so you don't want to double up on that sector. So essentially, you would you would uh, uh, use the software to then buy individual stocks. So when you look at your portfolio, now you see uh, ETFs, maybe, or mutual funds, some individual stocks. Now you're going to own all those stocks. You don't own a fund. I mean, I guess you could do a custom index that owns index, an index of indexes. <laughs> but that's a fund um, of funds. <laughs> yeah, it'd be it'd be a fund of funds. Um, you know, what I think has made this possible is well, I it's no thinking. I know it uh, is zero percent or zero dollar commissions because now now literally you can buy fractional shares in most custodians now, and it doesn't cost you anything to to trade equities. So you could own 6,000 stocks in a, in a custom index worldwide, global, right? And it's not going to cost you anything to make that purchase. Yes, even if the commissions, and it wasn't that long ago that they were $1.95. But even then. Prior to that, three ninety five, But even then, 1,500 securities, that didn't make sense. That's right. On that many securities. That creates a frictional cost around that, adding to the, the, the fee, essentially, you know, the custodial fee in the sense to custom indexing. Right. You, you, know. you mentioned technology, though. We've come so far in the last five, ten years. This wasn't something that would really be able to uh, take advantage of until recently. So I know you mentioned kind of uh, where we are today, but but looking forward uh, of all the opportunities that this would really, really provide for investors and uh, institutional investors as well. Yeah, it, it's important to note that this topic today, there's not much information out there about it. We, we This is the, you know, the, there's different phases of, technology adoption there's innovator early adapters uh early majority late majority and then laggards um you never want to be a laggard in our industry <laughs> <laughs> i see those at the etf conference and they're learning about ets for the first time and they they're older than us and i'm just like dude you know this was this this is 15 years ago and you're, you're poor just clients <laughs> i know that's what i think about they're poor clients <laughs> um but yeah, that we're definitely in the innovation phase of this. I, I can think of, uh, uh, from what I've been reading, there's there's about l- less than twelve companies out there that are able to deploy this right right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, very, it's some of it, it sounds like it's still very manual work as as this, as a designing software to you know in, in that this. stage it's often called the, the beta testing. And what happens during beta testing is that the the customer the user of the software through their usage, actually begins to give feedback to the software developers and say, well, we found that it could use a little tweak here, and we found that you know we want to be able to do this, and the software doesn't allow us. So then the software developers go back and, and build that as, as they go. So in, in the beta phases, you know, it's, it, those are definitely early adopters and innovators, and you kind of want to stay away from that. What's, what's interesting is it seems to be like the best of all worlds because – we we know cost matters, right? And, and that's why Vanguard's so popular. They ha- they provide, uh, and, and now State Street and BlackRock are the same way. But they provide cheap access to very broad exposure. Uh, we know that taxes matter to most clients. So if you money outside IRAs and four hundred one ks, we don't generate large tax bills unless we have to. We know that smart beta matters, or these are like factor based funds, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Um, you know, we use a little bit of that in our in our models here, but I, I'm certainly I'm not on the factor bus um, across the broad portfolio. Uh, I was just I, I, I've always seen it's kind of gimmicky, uh, and we have to be careful uh, about even new new things that get rolled out because the industry is really good about producing things that are flashy and shiny and and um, have apps. But the thematic funds are popular right now, so we talked about that in the ETF uh, right. podcast as well. Very but, true. But through direct indexing, you kind of you're able to kind of capture all or as little as that as you want. And, and what's neat is, you know, here we have what nine models that that we actively track and manage, and a good percentage of our clients fall into those models because they can, and that's what's in their best interest. But then we also have clients that have their own custom index, not like this. Uh, I'm sorry, own custom model. Right. Uh, so they have their own custom model because of their unique situation. And and what's neat is when I started in this industry, when I started this business 20 years ago, 
I couldn't do that. I couldn't create a custom model for a client and then have a computer trade it. And within 20 or 30 minutes, the portfolio is efficiently rebalanced and done. I had to do manual trades. You can't even buy a bond ETF then. (laughs) That's true. That's true. (laughs) Thank you for listening to our podcast. We really appreciate uh, all the feedback we've been getting from our listeners on future topics and uh, the uh, that a boy emails. We really appreciate that. Uh, we see listeners growing uh, every every single week, and that and that's fun for us, and we enjoy doing this. If you could take a minute, uh, depending on how you listen to the podcast, if you go to Spotify or Apple Podcast, um, and you could rate uh, our podcast a five star podcast, that'll help us in the rankings. We we continue to climb up each week, and the number of listeners, as well as um, uh, as well as the response uh, on, on the feedback online. And then we've also started a YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube, you type in Wise Wealth Management, you can find the weekly roundup, which is a video between myself and Brad or myself and Matthews each week, just talking about some of the various topics that we've seen and uh, some interesting thoughts we might have on those. Again, thank you for listening. Please give us uh, positive feedback online. Help us grow the brand. Thank you. Um, now, now we're able to assign a model to someone and they trade the exact same time as all the other models. Everyone gets the exact same price, exact same, uh, exact same time on the exact same shares in most cases. So it's, which means that other than cash flows, they get the exact same return. Yes. What they pay. Correct. That's right. Correct. Which is a fiduciary standard. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how one person shops do it. I don't think they do do it actually. <laughs> I know a few one single one people shops, and uh, I I don't think that everyone's getting the be- the same treatment, which is uh, which is concerning. Te- there's technology to allow for that these days, but with direct indexing or custom indexing, there's so many different ways to index. Uh, with custom <laughs> indexing, um, th- there's there's a way now that you can build for all this, but I I see some. I, I I see this really probably best served in the ultra high net worth market. I, I think two million plus in a brokerage account, not IRAs. Not you IRAs. don't need this in IRAs, I no. don't think, mm-hmm. um, unless you really want a certain factor. Uh, like if your if your passion is to have diverse boards and you only invest in companies that have diverse boards, but you don't care about guns and other stuff, you can just say invest in only. You know, S and P five hundred, but diverse boards only, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can take ESG and 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 totally break that up and break it down how, to the, the three it. components, and that would be a G for governance. Yeah, I think this would be really popular for that side of it for ESG, like you said, mentioning kind of what part of the ESG aspect is more important to you and what isn't. So I think that would be the more specific point to uh, ESG and how the uh, investment world uh, changes moving forward. But yeah, this is. Really for the ultra high net worth investor, high net worth investor uh, for these taxable brokerage accounts. But but think what this what this looks like because we're we're very much core indexers, and then we'll we'll take some uh, liberties on overweights and like technology, right, right. or quality. Mm-hmm. And I I just you don't own an ETF, you don't own a mutual fund in this case. You're going to own the individual stocks. So and basically, custom indexes you own every software. one of those securities. Right. So you're buying software to sort through all the stocks in the universe to say, I want these stocks. And then that's what essentially you're getting a trade ticket from the software. Then go to your custodian and say, I want to place these trades for across these accounts. And so when that happens, your, your individual, our individual clients in this case are going to see hundreds and hundreds of now stocks, even fractional shares of stock on their statements. Which I think it'll be it'll, that that'll be take some adjusting. I feel like, um, and certainly some coaching to say, well, this is why you now own the underlying stock, right? That you're not going to have just S and P 500 fund because clients don't think like that. They 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 don't think that that fund has 500 securities and across all their security ETFs they have 60 6500 stocks. I don't think anyone really thinks in those terms. Right, it's very difficult to wrap your brain around. As an investor, quite frankly, yeah. But the good news is that 
if you're working in individual stocks that are legacy stocks, if you had for a long time, now you're able to um, get out of those stocks in a very efficient manner, um, all driven by this technology. Right. Because what happens when you own all those securities, we all know that it's the market being as it is, some stocks are going to do well and some are going to not do so well at, at different times. The ones that uh, aren't doing as well, we do a, a trade that's called a tax loss harvest trade in a custom index. So what would happen is if securities have gone down in value, the advisor would sell those securities and then go to the security that you're holding that you have a high um, um, uh, level of, of ownership in sell some of it and use the gain, the loss in the securities that you sold that went down to offset the gain that was in the security that you that you held. And it's, you're going to harvest that tax loss for tax loss purposes. And then those proceeds are then reinvested back into the custom index, diversifying the portfolio. You know, one question that I had was proxies. When you own individual stocks, you get corporate actions, you need to vote proxies. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you imagine? I know. It's you, a lot of paper. I think as a firm, you'd, we'd have to change our uh, policy to where we vote proxies on their behalf. Um, and our policy is... It's not. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not a proxy. The mailbox would be full. Oh it, it's, no, it's no different than SMAs, though. I mean, SMAs have been doing this, having hundreds of securities within a, within a fund or within their managed account. Uh, but this is specifically uh, different in the fact that it is a lot more tax efficient being able to buy the individual index within that. Well, there's uh, there's people out there right now that say that 50 percent um, of advisors will be using this form of indexing by 2025. Um, I don't I don't know. I, I don't know if I fully buy into that. Um, advisors, financial advisors. Uh, are not innovators. They're very, most of them are very cautious. They're very slow to adapt to new things. Uh, hence so, the ETF. What is an ETF portion of the ETF conference is the most wi widely attended. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a, a huge leap for a lot of uh, advisors to, to get to 50% of, of the marketplace. Uh, like you're saying, Casey, there's still advisors that, you know, started in this business back in the 70s and 80s, and they're still selling mutual funds and, right. you know, yeah. uh, have filing cabinets, you know, along the entire back wall of the, <laughs> <laughs> right. of the room. And it, it just would seem for them to adapt and adopt to a, a new type of technology like this is just a huge leap of faith. That I, I do see those that never adopted fully to mutual funds, never adopted fully to... Um, uh, ETFs, I do see that this is a great pathway for them because it's still individual securities, right? So they're they're still an individual. There's in the end, they're just choosing their screen. It's like their screener is different, I guess. Yeah. Um, so so maybe there's some some options. It's uh, more customizable. Yeah, there for them. Uh, but it's it's hard to believe that in 2025 we we, we would be walking away from uh, ETFs and walking away. For mutual funds. Mutual funds still hold more assets than ETFs do right now. And think about ETFs are still fairly new in the industry, relatively speaking. Um, but you know, certainly, um, uh, certainly, you want to be an early adapter. Um, With these these fees, though, there's a lot of firms that aren't going to be incentivized to want to use something like a direct index because they're not going to make any money on it. You mean yeah. a, a trading firm? That's yeah, a trading Sodium? firm, brokerage. Mm -hmm. that it, they're not really incentivized for that. That's a good point. ETFs are already hard enough for them. Now if there's uh, direct index, direct indexing, um, I don't really see their their incentive to move forward with it. Yeah. Well, I struggle with that anyway. I mean, that's where most of the money in our industry is. They're at the big brokerage houses. I don't know why anybody would have their money there, which I think is why you see such a large uh, development of uh, family offices, RAs. Um, you see a large development of, of um, uh, guys like Merrill and, and um, uh, Morgan Stanley that have private wealth sides that the, those advisors have more freedoms than the line workers, you know, uh, line worker advisors on, on, on the traditional platforms. Um, 
I think because the, the ability to move and think and customize. So it, it, it I, I think in, this is that definitely gets led in the RAA space. I feel like, um, of course that doesn't say that those firms can't create the, their own indexes with their own wrapper. Right. And it's then, true. and then, and then upcharge for that. That's, That's always a possibility fee for it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess see them getting creative. They're always very creative on how they get paid. <laughs> there's, no, there's no doubt about that. They've had SMAs, <laughs> but there's some type of management fee or transaction fee, so they still made made some money on it. So, yeah, this would be a, a little different. I guess it would be uh, some type of management fee on top of it if it was just a direct direct index and there wasn't other transaction right. fees. Yeah, once I, the software is more fully developed and the technology is there to support it, I could see this becoming much more ubiquitous, uh, even offered at the – at the brokerage firm level, but the know, designers of fee. this, yeah. the designers of this think it's not going to be advisor led. It's going to be client led. So it'll be a client led uh, growth to 50% of the marketplace because clients are demanding that, that it happen. And that, that, that's the part I'm trying to wrap my head around. It's, I, I guess in our firm now we're de- our demographic here and, 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 uh, where we're located, um, we do, we don't have uh, really any clients that have called up and said, I demand ESG in my portfolio. In fact, I had the opposite, right? When ESG was in the Wall Street Journal uh, headline with I, uh, BlackRock, iShares making changes, we didn't have, we had the opposite. We had people calling us going, I don't want that in my portfolio. Like, don't, don't do that. And, and and when it comes to things like ESG, you know, we, we have a whole podcast on that too. Now, um, ESG outperformed in 2020, mm-hmm. not outperforming in 2021 right now. So that, that future remains to be seen. Are they willing to take portfolio losses versus the average and maintain <laughs> their ESG stance? I say no, but will, but in direct indexing, you could still be ESG, but you could tweak it. You can, right? Right. You could create your own <laughs> so you, ESG factor. Yes. Essentially. So you, you, you can check some boxes to make it more palatable to yourself, but yet still do things in the portfolio that allow you to reap S and P like returns. Like returns. Exactly. Exactly. So then maybe that maybe that makes it a client driven. I don't know. Um, this is one of the situations where we don't have all the answers, uh, and there's less than twelve fir- firms right now that are doing this and they don't have the answers. They're all just trying to figure it out as they, as they go along. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm actually excited about it. I, I, I think it from a passive standpoint, from a pure passive standpoint to be able to take an ultra high net worth client and be able to truly build around individual existing holdings. That's how I see it. You know, they, I think uh, on the platform, the firms that's, that's doing this now on their platform uh, let's see. They, I have the numbers here. Bear with me. Um, they have roughly, is it close to a billion dollars? Yes. It's close to a billion, but then how different they were. Uh, I think it was 70% of those are every, were unique. Were unique. Yes. So 70% of the portfolios, uh, they have 500 accounts and a billion dollars of assets and 70% of the 500 accounts have totally unique settings. Right. That's, yeah. From from, that, from that, very that, passive. That takes a lot of technology horsepower. That's right. Yeah. From very passive to all to be very, um, yeah. uh, very, uh, I guess, dynamic. Yeah. I guess we'd say yeah. that. But just imagine again. I'll go back to this: the ability to customize your portfolio, you know, and and then just you know invest it into the market, knowing that it truly represents who you are and what your objectives are, and taking out the middleman like a broker who's helping you decide these things on a one-off every time that you something comes up. You're just, you're, you've created a custom index. You've invested in it. It reflects you know, all your other holdings, your real estate, your, yep. you know, you know <laughs> like you said earlier, you know, options from the company that you may have worked at for 20 years, you know, and how comforting that can be for, for an investor. I, I think it's, an, it's exciting, and I think there's going to be more iterations between now and the time that it's fully rolled out to the RIA world. Um, and so I'm excited to see how it, how it you know, performs you know, going forward and where we could p- 
potentially plug into this type of technology in the future. Yeah, technology is always evolving, so it's nice to see uh, this starting and, and where that will build on uh, moving towards the future. What's interesting is the cost. So think about think about this. Right now, the software or the, the people that are, are developing this software, the cost to do this is around uh, 0.15 to 0.35% per year on, on the assets that are managed through this platform. But there's only one company doing it just like this. There's other companies that are doing similar, similar, but not exactly like this. So as more companies roll out and more software, it could be there's just cloud-based software eventually. And we right. just do this on our own. And we just pay a, some type of a platform subscription. So what happens to the vanguards and the Black Rocks and the State Streets? We can develop our own index. And what if this cost was almost free? Right? You know, I mean, essentially, it's the democratization of investing at the at its highest level. I mean, you're taking index and you're just completely obliterating the whole sponsor ETF world. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you still have to have the formula. So you still have to have help in developing the formula. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I maybe that's where those companies come in. It's like, here's our formula for this. And it's a different type of service, but it, very intriguing. Um, I think I think it's going to turn things upside down a bit, uh, especially in the ultra high net worth uh, asset management area. So, all right, well, great conversation as usual, guys. I'll uh, see you next week. Sounds great. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.